My name's Sasha Pete, and I'm joined by a fantastic individual. This man tore it up both in Europe and for the Socceroos. I'm joined none other than the great Jason Van Blurk. Jason, welcome to this conversation. Oh, thank you very much for having me. Appreciate it. So, Jason, tell us, how did you fall in love with our great game? Um, unfortunately, I was born into it. Um, my dad was a, a Socceroo. Um, come out here in the 60s, um, played for the great Arpia team in the 60s. And, um, yeah, that was it. Dragged along to every football game, every training session. Um, loved every minute of it. Um, met so many great people. Um, a lot of Socceroos, because obviously my dad played against a lot of them. And, um, yeah, it was fun. It was good times. So Cliff was pretty handy himself. And, and so what's it like ha ha having the expectation of you, you, you would have known that your, your father played at a decent level. What's it like having somebody who's accomplished, you know, playing at the, the, the NSL level and, and for, for Australia um, and then growing up in, in their footsteps? Oh, uh, it was no expectation because he really played it down and my dad's friends played it down. You know, always we always had Socceroos over our house, Pat Hughes, Archie Blue, you know. Um, and my dad told me many times, you know, you're better off grabbing a fishing rod and going fishing because I think he sort of just tried to, the expectation of being a professional player was, you know, it's not as glamorous as everyone makes it out to be. And I mm. think he just tried to give me a level head um, in those days to sort of, understand what is the expectation is to be you know make a living out of it mm -hmm, mm -hmm, the highs mm -hmm. and lows of a professional footballer okay so uh talk to me about your first junior club where did you where did you play at oh, well the thing about it i was a late starter my dad didn't want me to start playing until I was seven because he thought i would fall out of love with the game mm -hmm. and um and I kept on nagging my day, you know, come on, I want to play. Because I always played at school, you know, always took the mm -hmm. soccer balls at school. Because um, my dad was a soccer coach, so he had all these soccer balls in the garage. So I was, you mm -hmm. know, always, you know, Jason had the ball, you know, you know, with my ball, my rules sort of thing, mm -hmm. which was quite fun. Um, and one of my dad's friends, he played with that Arpia, um, George Nuttall. Mm -hmm. um, um, he was, he coached at Greenacre Soccer club and Greenacre had was quite a little famous club had um a couple of great players come out of there and I'll, we'll come to me in a minute but anyway so um so my dad was coaching at Arpio on the way to Greenacre he would drop me off I do the training mm -hmm. and on the way back he picked me up so I sort of um, that sort of worked in with his you know because obviously I come from a big family yeah I come from a big family of you know five siblings and and my mum didn't drive so my dad was the only one in the house at the car. So that sort of worked in with yeah. transport. And, um, yeah, and, of course, George Nuttall was an ex-professional himself. Um, and he had a son sort of around my age. That was that was sort of the starting point of uh, Greenacre. So, I mean, uh, but a seven-year-old, did they have under sevens at that time or were you playing up? I always played up. Always played up. Um, and that was the, the learning curve that it really showed, um, especially in Australia. Um, I always played up and it was just um, an advantage, I think. It, it helped me a lot to push forward in, um, in growing as a football player. Um, so I think I played under, mm -hmm. I think I was uh, six and I think I played under sevens. So I always played a year, a year up. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, the uh, so the, the London game, you've got your dad who uh, historically played. He's now coaching uh, at Arpia. How do you how do you progress through? Do you, do, you, do you play for representative sides? You know, we were talking about 13, 14, 15, 16. Um, talk to me about those years. Um, actually, I, I, I played at Greenock up to was about. 11, I think. And then um, actually Auburn, Auburn Football Club was sort of um, progressing and they were looking for players. Um, and there was an old coach, um, oh, what's his name? I can't remember. Anyway, so Auburn was a quite a successful club. And above 
above me was basically um, Robbie Slater played for him. Um, the Wall Brothers was playing for him. Um, mm-hmm. So there was a good culture at the club. Mm-hmm. And Lenny Quester, that was his name, Lenny Quester, English guy, professional, mm-hmm. come out from the strap. And um, very, very studious, you know, if you don't come to training with a towel, then don't bother coming because he always expects you to have a shower after training. Um, okay. Yeah, one of those guys, you know, the wellness of the of, of the of the professional footballer was very high class, and um, so I was there for I think only a season or maybe two, and I learned a lot there under him. Um, and and then after that, I sort of basically just went to um, join up with um, Arpia because my dad was still coaching under the sixteens or eighteens, and and um, I sort of sort of I think I got the Arpia under fourteens, and I played under fifteens. So yeah, that was that was my early years, um, and then from there I just sort of was out up your junior from I think under fourteen to well I was fourteen playing under fifteens, and so forth up to um, up to about under nineteens, and then I got um, drafted into the AIS. Okay, and so do you remember your uh, so th- was it your AIS your first foray against playing against men, or did you make your senior debut? Um, earlier than that? No, I always played, like, for instance, I always played New South Wales on the 14s and 15s and 16s, all the, all the way up to the under 18s. Um, then I was playing uh, under 19s when I was uh, 17 or something like that. Okay, yeah. And then, obviously, um, things were changing and then I just, then I, I, didn't, I didn't make any first team debut because I was 17. And then AIS... Mm-hmm. Um, Ronnie Smith coming for me with uh, Jimmy Shoulder, and um, mm-hmm. that was fantastic. And that was probably the big, uh, big learning, learning curve. curve. I when I, yep. Yeah, we went to the AIS, and and that one year I didn't stay for the second year, but the, the, that one year was just yeah, the, the things I learned and understood yep. was magnificent. Talk to me about some of the some of the el- some of the other boys that were in your year uh, through my junior year. No, no, no. In your AIS year. Oh, jeez. Um, uh, Paul Trimboli, um, Paul Foster, uh, Jason Pollack, uh, Johnny Kosh, played for the Olympic, both of them played for Sydney Olympic. Um, who else was there? Uh, Davy Clarkson, South Melbourne boy. Um, Kurt Reynolds, who was the Australian under-20s captain. Um just the ones you know. Um, Timmy Mullins was a brother of uh, one of the brothers of from Adelaide. Um, yeah, so that's basically it. Yeah. Yep. And many uh, socceroos that you've mentioned in there. So it, it goes to show that the AIS um, was that really nice finishing school where you got, oh, yeah. got, to, yeah. got to train like a professional. Um, and the setup there, um, being away from home, I mean, mm. is that mm-hmm. is that sort of that halfway point, probably not as not as uh, uh, complex as being away and speaking in a different language in a different country no. and not having friends, no. but it, it's, it, it has that professional um, note. And so after the AIS, um, was, was then your transition across to Blacktown City? Yeah, yeah, the old NSL, yeah. Um, I had a chance, I was probably staying another year at AIS, but... Um, yep. Um, I thought, you know, I sort of get bored with certain things and I seen the expectation of going to into the NSL at, a, well, I think it was only 19. Um, you know, playing against men week in, week out was more beneficial for me because I did at a younger age, you know, I did at a young age growing up. So I always liked that, you know, that challenge mm. and going into Blacktown City. And, and I suppose also with Lance Schoenflug was the under-20s coach and a sort of, you know, I was under his wing at Blacktown City. So that sort of, we're going into that um, Youth World Cup year. And mm. um, and that's where I sort of, to progress as a, a player, I had to sort of, you know, and then going into the Youth World Cup where you played against those great teams, you know, the, the Czech Republic and um, um, the, Chil- the Chileans and, you know, South mm. Americans. So I thought, going into that year, I thought I'd the step up into the old NSL and that was a, a big learning curve, yeah. So the, the, that, that would have been a great experience as a young boy being in the under-20 squad and, and Scheinflog. Talk to me firstly about Scheinflog's style as a coach. <laughs> um, style, well, um, 
yeah, he was, look, very disciplined, very disciplined. Um, mentally, he prepared you. Uh, physically, he prepared you. But at the end of the day, when you get on that pitch, you know, when you're playing against, you know, these top players, it's, it's a different expectation. So mm. he, he trained us and mentally prepared us the best he could. Um, yeah, strong character. Les, yeah. The boss. Les, you know? yeah, um, yeah, he used to come out with some great saying, you, know, you, if, you take, if I give you my fingernail, you'll take my whole, whole arm and things like yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. So um, yeah, great character. Um, obviously, same same era. You know, he played against my dad back in the sixties. Yeah. Know, that, um, and back in the sixties, Australia wasn't in the under UEFA. So a lot of um, Austrian internationals, a lot of internationals, come out to Australia to play because you know mm. Australia wasn't under FIFA. So that's where um, football sort of took off in the sixties. And a lot of those coaches, those players, who played in the sixties slash seventies, went on the coach. Mm. in Australia and I think that's how you know the reputation of Australian football built and and the, the mental side of the, the, the football sort of took on a, you know a higher level as well so talk to me about that first that first feeling of uh playing uh for your national team so I think yeah you got selected uh in in around 90 mm. um so do you remember the, the game and, and what that feeling was like? Yeah, I think I cried after the game. I think. Mm. <laughs> um, I think it was in Jakarta, I think we played. I think one of my first match. Um, and I think I was rooming with um, Kim on Talidoris. Yep. And, uh, yeah, so um, yeah, Kim on were young pups in this Aussie squad and uh, we had a great time. We learned a lot. Um, great characters in the, in the squad. Um, yeah, that, I think that was my first tour, and mm-hmm. I think my, one of my first games for Australia. Yeah, yeah. And so um, it's in around the the time that um, so you you've moved from Blacktown City to to Apia Lycar, yeah. your dad's old uh, stomping ground. Yeah. Um, and and spent a, a season there, and then you get selected into the Socceroos. So, firstly, why the move from Blacktown to to Apia? Oh, they bought me. I got sold for seven and a half thousand dollars. Big money in those days. Yeah, so yes. Arpia, Arpia bought me. Yep. So um, in those days, it was relegation. I think we, Blacktown was a good learning curve because I just got our, we just got our relegation that season. I think the last kick of the game, we had to play down in Melbourne. Can't remember against who. Um, basically, we got out of relegation. Um, it was a dog fight. And then, mm. um, <clears throat> and the sort of, yeah, Arpia come in for the seven and a half thousand done. There you go. So, um, and I went to Arpia for a season, I think. And yeah, um, yeah I think we got into the top four, or maybe just outside the top four. Yeah. And um, and then I sort of um, started to play a few international games. Yes. Um, which is great because in the in in January February, when a lot of the Europeans used to come out because of the winter break, so the Swedish and the Czechs used to come out, and I picked up a few international caps there, and um, yeah, that sort of helped and. The playing against those top teams all the time, that's what a lot of players miss at the moment. They don't play against the player, those regular top teams, and you need mm. that to progress as a football player. Mm, mm. The yeah. um, So you, you're you breaking into the Socceroos squad and you get a you get an opportunity, I think, to go to Belgium. Is that is that yeah. uh, right? Um, yeah. So how, how did did you have many options? So you... No. Um, because going going nineteen circa early nineties going to Europe is not easy unless of course you've got a, a foreign passport or European passport mm. that you can play in that country, mm. um, which many players obviously did. But um, talk to me about your circumstance, how you went across to Europe. I think Belgium was was different. I think you could get into Belgium without a visa. So a lot of, that's why a lot of players went to Belgium in the early days. Yep. Yeah, the likes of yeah, yeah, o- Ocon and and uh, Lawrence Kidner, etc. So okay, yeah. the um, so the, your first your first time uh, over overseas, what what's that experience like in Belgium? Cold. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, cold. I mean, I remember watching my first match; it was like minus ten, and I'm thinking, geez, wow. yeah. yeah, and um. And then, then playing in in, in, the, in the cold and and um, I didn't mind the cold. 
playing, it was, I was fine. I used to wear short, you know, short sleeves and things like that. But um, yeah, it just some sessions were, you know, the ground was ice. It was like playing on yes. black marble. Yeah. Um, yeah, fog used to just come into some games and be fogged over <laughs> in the game, but they kept on playing. Um, mm. So yeah, Belgium was, um, yeah, and the language barrier as well, because back yep. in those days, I was lucky because I stayed with a family and um, the family, um, uh, her sister was an English teacher um, and, the, and the kids could speak a good English, which is great. And I said to her, how did you learn English? She goes, oh, I was just in the war time when the American soldiers come in through, through Belgium. And I said, we started you know, talking to a lot of Americans and that's how they learned their English. So um, it was quite uh, interesting. But yeah, Belgium was cold. But um, yeah, I got through it for the year. Um, unfortunately, only stayed a year. Um, tried to stay over there for a bit longer, try and pick up another club in Belgium, which I couldn't. And then I basically pulled the pin in the round about October that year and I come back to Arpia for about, um, oh, for that season. Mm-hmm. And and that's and coming into the new new year, I picked up a lot of Australian international caps. And to get mm-hmm. a work visa into another country, you had to play more than 15 times for your country. And that sort of helped me in that mm-hmm. period of leaving Belgium and coming back to Arpia. And then I, I picked up a few international caps. And then I, after the next season, I went and got a, um, a sign for my um, Dutch team, Goat Eagles. Yeah, so and, and you played there a, a few seasons. So what's, yeah. the, what's the standard like? If, to, to give people an understanding, you've got, mm. you've got the NSL, I take it in Belgium, be slightly, um, obviously, uh, More physical. Is, is it improved league? And then and Netherlands mm. is a step up again? Yeah, it was, it, the Dutch league and the NSL were not. I mean, so the Belgian league wasn't much, you know, much different. Oh well, it is different. It, it was more the, the Belgian league was more physical. It was mm-hmm. a more physical, robust league back in those days. And then you go from, uh, and then you go into the Belgian where it was a little bit more tactical, a little bit more ball movement, uh, a lot, a lot of um, uh, movement off the ball. It was more uh, combination plays. You know, you mm-hmm. play with a lot of combinations: the left full back with the left winger. The inside right or you know the number number eight sort of thing. So you play with a little bit more combination where the Belgian league was a little bit more um, diverse. You know they play with back three sometimes, they play with back four. Um, mm-hmm. So it was a bit more similar to the to the old NSL. You know, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. and a lot of a lot of um, different people played in it. You know, a lot of people from Africa, a lot of people from, from France used to come up because the, the, the money in, in Belgium days, it was all black money. So a lot of players just getting, you know, you know, cash-free money, tax-free money. So, mm-hmm. so um, that's why that league was a little bit more, you know, suited to a lot of Australians that went over there. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm. And the, the three years were in Netherlands. Talk to me about some of the other guys that are in this league at that time. You're there from... from- the, the sort of early to mid nineties. Who were some of the characters either in at Go Ahead Eagles or opponents that you played against? Well, Go Ahead Eagles was a young team that come up from the second division, so I was sort of one of the mm. oldest guys. So we just had a lot of young players. Mm. Um, um, one of the famous ones that come out where I played was Paul Bostel. He used to play. He played for Feyenoord and went on to play for um, Man City and things like. That. So characters was just more like a, a team. It was just more. Okay. Up- you know, the old NSL had more characters, you know, <laughs> more, 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 you know, uh, more players that you sort of, you know, you know, kick the hell out of you was more than anything. Um, but, you know, then I went from Belgium to, I'm sorry, I went from Go at Eagles to, to Millwall, you know, and that's yes. where things sort of changed from there, you know. So, so uh, yeah, talk to us about, so uh, you're, you're at Millwall, which is a, um, fantastically supported club very mm. people are very passionate um if you look back if you look back at your career you played for a number of english clubs but mm. so talk to me about your affinity to 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 millwall as opposed to any of the other clubs that you played at oh well, the way I, i'll go back a bit further the way i got to millwall was that dave mitchell was rooming with me in the australian national team dave was at yeah. dave was at millwall yeah I sort of finished up with Go at Eagles. I, I could have stayed at Go at Eagles, but I just wanted another challenge and always wanted to play in England, you know, mm-hmm. growing up, watching Match of the Day on TV. 
Yeah. And so it's always wanted to play in England. Dave Mitchell was, you know, at Mill at the time and I had another mate who was at Leicester and I sort of, you know, can you get me a trial? And sort of Dave spoke to Nick McCarthy and, mm-hmm. um, yeah, and I went out for a week's trial and signed. So um, that was a, a, a help. In those days, um, it, was, it was always if you knew somebody or someone else can help you or someone can have a, you know, you know, drop a word here, a word there, you know, obviously you didn't have the, you know, mobile phones would come in, the internet was really around. It was more, you know, you know, word of mouth and things like that. So, um, yeah, I sort of uh, left go at Eagles and, and ran over to Millwall. So in not- those days, I didn't really know what Millwall was like or who, yeah. who was Millwall, you know. So, yes. Yeah. The, the, um, the, so, but the, you've got the, you've got the, um, the credibility about having played for Australia. So they, yeah. they know. So when, when Dave Mitchell's talking about, listen, I've got somebody who I think would be good enough for our squad. Yeah. Dave's a very accomplished uh, socceroo at the time, right? And, yeah. and, and, and playing for Melwell, uh, doing quite well, being one of the more prominent uh, players in the squad. So his weight, his word carries weight with the, the, the managerial class there. Oh, yeah, 100%. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, and, and Dave was a good character, you know, and, yeah. and, and you know, the, and the manager always, you know, obviously because he's a good character, so, you know, and the benefit that I had was um, I was more of a, because um, being a left-sided player, that was always people were always looking for that balance in their squad. And I could play a couple of positions down that left-hand side, you know, centre-back, left, you know, wing-back, winger, things like that. So I was more of a, um, a player yes. that you know, they could, you know, rely on in playing several positions. And the benefit in those days as well, um, because of the reputation of Australian players and the, and the coaches knew that if Australian player, they ever had a good Australian player, that they knew they would get, you know, a, a, a good all-rounder player who could actually, you know, fit in well into the squad. And, and you knew, and knew that they're, they're going to give you 110% each week. So the... Uh... It was that 95 season, I think, that Millwall had a really good cup run. Yeah, um, talk to me. So, so um, you had, I think, a couple of uh, managers uh, at, at Millwall there. So that would have... So uh, uh, transition time, I think, uh, having chopping and changing uh, managers would have been... Uh, it started off well. Put it that way, it started off well. Okay. <laughs> Because Mick McCarthy and Ian Evans were a good balance, you know, and Mick okay. McCarthy, you know, you know, going on, well, being a young manager and progressing to where he ended up. And we had a good rounded team there. We had a lot of young players with a lot of older players. Um, and I always say, you know, I had an interview with, you know, um, with Millwall. We didn't have any dickheads in the squad. And mm-hmm. when you don't have those, you know, those guys, you know, who want to be outside of the squad, it's like the, when we had the soccer team back in the, when we played Argentina, you know, we had a good, Good squad, you know. We mm. didn't have any what I call dickheads, but anyway. Um, mm. So um, yeah, so we we went on. We went on, I I got the Millwall. Had to wait five weeks for my visa to come through. I got into the squad. Ended up breaking three ribs in a in yeah. a game, a, a cup match. Out for another six weeks. Got back into the squad, and then we started progressing. And um, yeah, we played the likes of uh, <clears throat> Arsenal in the cup, um, home and away. Actually, we had a draw at home. Um, beat them away, um, end up playing Chelsea. It was just one of those interesting draws that we end up playing the London teams. Mm. Playing Chelsea, uh, went to penalties, actually played them at home, draw, had a draw, played them away, went to penalties. Um, we beat them 5 4 on penalties. Uh, did you slot one that night? Yeah, yeah, got one that night. Um, yes. Millwall ended up winning. Um, I think then. And one at the um, stay in the change room for a while because what happened was after the game, after we won the <laughs> game, we went to celebrate down that end, and about 500 Chelsea supporters come over the fence and started. And we went, Oh no, we sort of we linked it back to the change room, and a few players got caught out. I think even Dave Mitchell got caught out there and okay. kicked them, beaten. Any, and then, any bruises? Any bruises on Mitchell? I think there was, yeah, and um, <laughs> Ben Thatcher, who he went on to play for Spurs, he got he got caught in the um, in the crowd. So um, that was an interesting night. And I think Millwall players end up going down Kings Road and smashing that. Oh, sorry, Millwall, Millwall fans end up going down Kings Road and smashing in every window on the way home. That's the thing. So you're talking about the mid '90s in in London. You know, mm. it's fierce rivalry. I mean, it's it's gotten mm. a lot more tamer, and the police are onto it now, but. Mm. The mid mid nineties, all, all the way up to, to two thousand. 
Yeah. These 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 fans are fanatical, um, and the football violence on the park, off the park becomes quite inter- integral to sort of the, the club culture. How did if you were loyal to to a team that I, I take it they were um, also pretty supportive? Um, you bounced around a bit in in uh, in uh, in the UK. Talk to me about that when you've left Morwell and now you're across to, to Manchester City, who still now at the time it would be one of the, the bigger clubs. Um, did you cop yeah. any flack uh, for moving? Um, not really, because I think towards the end of my mill, my, my contract, things have changed that much. The next season went in there. Uh, we end up the first 10 games, I think we're top of the table. Um, then Mick McCarthy left, mm. and, we, and then we end up getting relegated on the last mm. game of the season by a point or something. Okay. Like. Um, and then the next season we're in, in, in D two, and then a, a new manager take or manage, a new manager come in the season before, and then in the next the season. I, and I wasn't in his picture, and I sort of didn't play much that season through injuries, and you know, mm. didn't, we didn't really get on. And then I got sold to Man City. But mm. the thing, the rivalry was that Man City and Millwall, we never played against each other. Okay. We never played against each other because Millwall were down and back down in the second division. Yep. Uh, Man City were back up in the, you know, Div 1 at that time. Yep. And then um, and then went to this big club. It was just a massive club. And put it this way, I was number 45 on my shorts. So yep. I was number 40. So it was basically free, free training sheds that you have to go in and basically it was like the first grade, like the second grade and the guys that were on the outer who basically that, because all these managers to come in and because these guys are on big money, they said, well, I don't have to leave. I can just sit here and not play football, but they still got to pay me my 5,000 pound a week or whatever these guys are on. So there was free change room and I found a little bit coming from, you know, a Millwall squad, which had done so well on a small budget, on a small squad, and then you go to this big club, you know, Man, Man City, where you're playing in front of 30,000 each week, you take away between five and 10,000 on the away game. It was just massive. It was just a, a mm. culture. It wasn't culture shock. It was just, you know, this is, if you want to play you know, at a higher level, at a big club, this was a, you know, that was a massive club. Mm. Massive mm. club. And so uh, talk to me about some of the, the, uh, the more prominent because they had a number of internationals at the yeah. time um, yeah. there at, at City. I think there was yeah. a was it a um, Romania or a Georgian that was Georgie. there. Georgian, yeah. Georgian, a, yeah. yeah. So um, he was quite quite quality, wasn't he? So he was like um, me and Georgian, we, we got on really well. We're good friends. Okay. Um, yeah, he he'll probably be one of the best players I've played with. You know, he was, he was similar to Maradona, all left foot. Um, yeah, from Georgie, from you from Georgie, you can clapsy. Um, he Google him, he's got he's come out with some famous goals, one against Villa. Um, yeah, he was he was a he was a, he was a legend. He had, he, had a, he had his entourage, don't worry about that. He had a couple of big Manchester boys looking after him. Yep, and um, at the time I was driving my little golf um diesel just around, and he used to say to me, Jason, why do you drive this tractor? I drive this in in Georgia. Where you drive this tractor? I went, oh, so Georgia was driving this Ferrari around. And yeah. Just, and the, the famous one, he come out a, 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 I don't know, I think it was a, not a nightclub, but like he'd come out of a restaurant or something like that. And he'd come out and he'd hit it at hard. He must have hit some black ice. And then Georgia ended up getting flipped out the car. Oh, wow. Yeah, flipped out the car, ended up with stitches in his back. And then, and then the, the couple of days after when I said, I went, and that's why I drive my little tractor, Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah. the the so we're, we're talking about um, money, the decent money starting to become involved in football. Not not obviously to the level no. um, that it is today, but you know enough that um, the the amount of money you could you, you could start setting your, your your life. How talk to me about that that uh, that experience? Did you find that the footballs that you were with were smart about the money that they were making and investing it, or they were going out and blowing up, blowing it. What what was? The, did you have advice from um, you know financial no, people? No, or? no. 
No, that in those days is you weren't really on great. Oh, well, what's great money? You know, um, mm. um, obviously, good players are on the good money, and, and that's what people don't get. There is a there is a budget of you know certain players are on certain mouth, the next players on this large, and that next players on that. The same like the uh, the NRL here in in, in Australia. You know, you, everyone can't be on that top money because the, the yes. clubs can't afford it. So obviously, you've got your limit on you know, what you're capped at as they see you as capped as a, as a player. Um, yeah, a lot of players look after themselves. You know, there is players who, you know, will piss up against the wall. Well, that's just, you know, them. Um, some obviously got into properties. Um, some put into cars. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, a lot, a lot of them did it in different ways. I think, yeah, a lot of them in those days, you know, probably, probably should have looked after their money a bit more. The, the but you, by this time you, you're well and truly uh, got many caps for the Socceroos. I think you played over thirty times in your in your career for for Australia. The um, do you have a manager or somebody advising you or an agent to to or is it to, what what's the the level of involvement or you just I don't you know, agent agent really never got into that agent was just basically just to move you on from player to player. My agent we used to say, well, I'm not a financial advisor. Go and get yourself a financial advisor. You know, he was just okay. that. And that's where, you, you know, look, this agent is trying to be everything they're not, you know, and you have to be careful who you have, you know, who's your agent or, or you know, where you put your money. And a lot of players got stung as well, you know. They put mm. them into things they should never put their money in. Um, obviously, you know, the circumstances, a lot of the socceroos put their money into this filming company in England for some reason I don't understand it all but they, they lost a lot of money themselves so yeah a lot of players you know start to earn this lot of money and I think what do I do with it mm. you know how do I you know you know secure it for my future and, they, and a lot of players didn't understand that as well um I sort of was pretty level-headed and I didn't you know I was pretty wasn't one of those flamboyant players who went out and bought cars and things like that. You know, I tried to, you know, you know, because in the day, you know, you're only a professional player for so long and you retire yes. a long time, you know, you retire a long time. And if you don't make that money to, 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 to help you through, you know, and a lot of players that have finished, had finished playing football, had to go and find a job. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, I think you last uh, seven or, so months at uh, at Manchester City, and then you were signed um, for West Brom Albion, yeah. where you stayed many seasons, and and you were a main stock of that squad. Mm. So, um, talk to me. How, how did you move from from Manchester City over to West Brom? Uh, I was <clears throat> so Joe Joe Royal coming to Man City, and sort of you know, obviously he, he changed the squad a lot, and he you know obviously he did well for Man City. And um, he basically just tried to get rid of players and players who weren't playing. I was sort of uh, I think I was injured at that, at the time. I think I started ten games and come on for ten games, and then um, and then all of a sudden my agent sort of rang me and saying West Brom um, were after you, and basically it was um, so it was interesting because my parents were out at the time, and then I sent my parents off in to do to Scotland for that week. And then the time I come back, I said to my dad, he goes, Oh, you're playing for Man City this week? He said, No, Dad, I'm playing for West Brom this week. He goes, What? <laughs> he goes, I said, Yeah, so I, I got signed for West Brom. And basically, I, I went down on the Thursday for a medical, uh, was basically touched my toes. And on the Friday, I think I touched my toes and I was on the bus for the away game. And I was playing for West Brom that day. So, so that they'd uh, heard enough about you or saw, seen enough about you just and you're in the squad. The yeah. medicals the medicals light on. So long as you walk in, you're happy. Are you good, Jason? Yes, yeah. I'm good. Yeah. All right, you're on the bus. Yeah. Um the uh yeah. n- no scans, no because no. you've had you've had you've had a number of injuries throughout your, your time there. It's a tough league, right? Ooh. So and oh, it's, yeah. it's 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 quite quite physical. Um mm-hmm. The uh, what's it like? Uh, do you feel like a bit of a commodity where you just okay one one week you, you're thinking you're playing in 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 Manchester, the next minute you're you're in a different part of the country. 
Yeah, well, that's the, and that's the, going back to what I was saying before about you know growing up. You know, you you got to adjust to a lot of things. You know, it's going to be a lot of ups and it's going to be a lot of downs. And I think in my my youth growing up, there was a lots of ups and downs. You know, and that, like going back to what, what my dad said, you know, you're better off going fishing because it's not going to be an easy easy road. Mm. And I didn't really know what he meant about that, but you know, looking back, you know, I had that mental strength. You know. You know, some will say that, you know, I wasn't the best player or I wasn't this, I wasn't that. But I think a lot of young, those young socceroos in the early 90s and playing the old NSL, mentally they were tough. Mm. They were, you know, you play against some tough players, but they were mentally they were tough. You mm-hmm. know, they could, you know, and, and back in the early Arpia days, I used to, you know, go and, you know, watch my dad train the under 20s or something. And then the first graders come in and you got, you know, like um, you got players used to come in, you know, mowing lawns all days and, you know, uh, you know, or doing roofers all day and they come in and have a shower and they're, and they're out in the soccer pitch training their heart out. And you're thinking, mm. they had a, in a tough day, but they, mm. you know, they get out there and they train hard for their club. So looking at that and then going to fast forward to when I was, you know, left, Man City to play for West Brom. Mentally, I was, you know, I was, I was, I was fine. I was, I was okay. Ready. Oh yeah, ready to go. And then yeah, off I went. So three and a half years at West Brom. Yeah, great club. Um, funny times. Um, come across some interesting characters. Um, I think the, the the one you've probably heard of is Lee Hughes, the famous. Yes. Yeah, um, he's from Smedic, a sort of area uh, on the outskirts of Birmingham. Um, he was a roofer. Uh, growing up, um, obviously ended up, you know, uh, getting sold to Coventry um, and then ended up, you know, having a car accident and, you know, going to jail for six years. Mm, mm, the, yeah. uh, but fan, fantastic player. Um, was So who are the other lads in the West Brom uh, Albion side that you thought, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm glad that these guys are on the, on the pitch with me? Mm. Oh, uh, we had a lot of the teams I played with. We had a lot of players that always moved on. Millwall, we had Mark Kennedy, who got sold to Liverpool. Um, ben Thatcher, he got sold. Um, Andy Roberts got sold to Crystal Palace. So we had these a lot of players that a lot of players move on. And then I went to the West Brom. We had um, Kevin Kilbane that went on to play for Everton. Mm. Obviously, Lee Hughes who went on to play for Coventry. Um, mm. uh, Richard Sneakers was a Dutch boy who played in midfield with me. Uh, with us, um, uh, Appleby, who who coached, uh, I think he still he coached, actually went on coach West Brom. We mm. brought him in, so yeah, you you, and that's what people would say. You say, oh, who's your best friends? You play with the football. You never really got to, you know, have best friends because most of them usually moved on, or it was yes. just more acquaintance. You know, that was you just yes. sort of built the squad and that happiness in the squad. But then certain players would come in, certain players go out. And, you know, it's just the way it was. And, you yep. know, yeah. and, and a lot of these clubs are, are selling players sometimes to survive, to balance their books, right? Because you yeah. offload a player, you get somebody for whatever reason. So mm-hmm. the um, so, so in this time, you're, you're playing for a number of um, uh, bridge clubs, so Millwall, Manchester City, West Brom. And mm. at that time, you're playing for Australia. And you've mm. had um, – so firstly um, – who, who are the boys that you roomed with? You said Kim on in the young soccer in the young uh, uh, soccerroo side, but who did oh. you room with um, throughout your? Oh, a few. Um, Andy Burnell was one of them. Um, okay, we were on our we went to South America on a trip. Uh, I think we played Uruguay, Argentina. Then we played USA down in Florida. So yep. Andy Burnell was my, which is great to have because he could speak Spanish, which is great. You know, always helped. Um, yep. um, Oh, Dave Mitchell, like I said before, was one of the characters that I room with. Um, yeah, that, that was probably the ones that come to mind. The rest I can't really remember, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, like that soccer squad was, you know, it, that was a, a good team, um, a strong team, and with some, you know, good characters in it. You know, went on to play, you know, against Canada and obviously the famous Argentinian team. Um, yeah, and um, it was also a tough. We, we've got to we mention that the, the, the qualifying path was actually quite difficult, you know. The mm. we, we, you know, having to, to top our group and then play, you know, 
you know, the third or fourth weakest uh, South American squad uh, and lining up against Argentina, it's got to be intimidating. Um, so, you know, you boys put up a, a decent fight. Uh, I, I had uh, you know, Paul Way, yeah, he had some great uh, players in that team. It wasn't that bad, but yeah, leave uh, Maradona go for, you know, a second and he just does this beautiful cross and Ooh. finds the head of an Argentinian goal, right? So that's uh, that's what the magic's about, right? Of course, um, yeah. yeah. And, and it's, it's hard to, when you're out in that pitch, those moments just, you know, click on a finger and things change. Yeah. Um, but that, like I said, that was a good squad full of, you know, good characters um, and we worked hard for each other. Off the, I think that, that squad and, and, and the squads after that, I think what people don't see is that, we work a lot harder off the ball. And that's mm. what, you know, on the ball, well, we're not creating this, we're not doing that. But the thing about it was that, you know, obviously you're playing against a lot better teams, you know. So our ball, our, our defence and our work rate off the ball had to be a, at a high, high speed. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And that's the one, the one thing that I think characterises uh, Australian sides is our work rate uh, without the ball. Um, something that if we could say what is, what is Australian football, right? I think we're we're trying to be adopt maybe somebody else's style. I think we need yeah. to have our own identity. And the mm. one the the one good thing I think about your game is you were that utility player. You, you, you know whether it's at left back or in left midfield, um, mm. uh, you you had that that versatility in your game, right? Mm. Something that's probably lacking uh, now with. Um, the mentality of footballers. Uh, mm. I coach a, I coach a fourteens and seventeen year old side, and I put a, an attacking midfielder in at left back, and it was it was almost like I was blaspheming him, right? So uh, he was like, mm. you you want you want to comment about because did you did you find that your your versatility enabled you to to fit into many systems? Oh, for sure. Well, for sure. Yeah, well, growing up, you played the old four four two. When I went to the AOS, you played a you know a four four two sort of thing, and but you had to sort of you know um, you could roam around a bit more, but off the ball you had to be a bit more structured. Going into the national team was a more three five two system, and when you play, and the thing about you, even like in Brazil, they coach you to play several positions because at the end of the day, they want to to sell you on. They want to be that all round player that can sell you on to these clubs. And they can play several different positions. And the old Dennis Burke camp was his famous saying that when he's growing up, the, the coach put him back, back at centre back. He goes, "What are you playing me at centre back for?" He goes, "Well, I want you to learn how what a striker does and how the striker moves. And so you, I want you to play against another striker, see what he does, an older striker to see, you know, how he's moving and how you know and how what, what a centre half does, mm. you know, what centre back does. So yeah, it's it's." And that's where these players, the younger players this day, they, 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 they've got to learn the game as a whole, not just a number on your back, to be honest. Mm, 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 mm. Wise words. I say that in a nice way. <laughs> the, the, uh, from West Brom, you, you bounce around to a, to a number <laughs> of sides, so Hull, Shubri. Um, so talk to me about um, that time in your career mm. and what, what's going through your mind, what's, what, what's happening Oh, so I was coming up the end of the contract at West Brom and we got into the playoffs that year. So I was coming to my 33 slash 34. I was actually 34 at that time. Mm -hmm. And I was playing wing back that year. And I had probably the best season I had for okay. four um, off the back of getting, getting um, into the playoffs. Um, you know, I was probably running 12 to 14 Ks a game. Easy. Yeah, that's big. Big you know, numbers. I was big numbers up and down, and and um, so how's the body feeling today? No, not today. <laughs> <You're> back... <laughs> no, that back as it. It was fine, and, and the thing about it in those days, the the, the wellness of it um, had come into it a lot more. You know, the, the mm -hmm. ice bars, the massage after the games, um, the warm downs started to come into to into the English game a lot more. So mm. towards the back end of my career, but when I come from Holland, they were they were so advanced in the wellness part of it. You know, the, the saunas and the showers and the hot baths. They did used to do the hot baths after the game, after the training, and after games, and you know the um, 
uh, massages, things like that. So I took that into Holland, into England. But okay. that, that sort of got better. Um, you know, in the olden days when you first got the mill wars, basically <laughs> you get out of the training pitch and you go and have a go and hop in this bath with about 10 other guys who didn't shower before they got into the bath and they got mud all over their mm. <laughs> club and you just sit there and watch this film of, of dirt just hover a pub in the bath and you'd be sitting there going, oh, jeez. And, and then I used to get out of, out of the shower, out of that bath and go and have a shower. But most of them used to just get out, clean themselves and off they go to the pub. Yes. <laughs> the uh, So the, you, you, you've learned from the from the... The, the the Dutch mentality to look after your body. Do you think that that yeah. held your career well into your thirties? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, longer because I, I end up coming back home in um oh oh five. I think I played for for Wollongong in the yeah. NSL for a season for half a season. I was thirty six then. Um, then I went on and coached um, Northern, oh, well, the old Northern Spirit, which is Spirit FC. I was still playing then up to my 38s into my, I was I finished at 40 actually. Okay. Um, so yeah, it does, it did help. It did help a lot. Um, but um, yeah, it's sort of, um, and I learned that from early age from my dad as well, you know, I've been a professional. I used to say, you know, you weren't, I wasn't allowed out the front door until I had, you know, my five week mix and something to eat before I go and play football. Of course, he said, well, what are you going to run on? You can't, you need something to run on. You know, you mm. need energy to run on. So he sort of mentally prepared me that way as well. Mm, mm, mm. The, um, so talk to me about the, the, the uh, Socceroo coaches uh, that you had at your time. You, you talk about Lesh, uh, Scheinflug uh, with the mm. young Socceroos. Um mm. And in the national team, you would have had uh, Thompson. Um, I just had Eddie. Of... I had Eddie, Eddie. Then I went into a training camp with Venables. Um, I didn't make that squad. Um, yeah, Eddie was Eddie Thompson. You know, he come from that old Sydney City, um, very strong squad back in those days. You know, had um, Cosmina. Um, mm. We also had Frank Farina play for him. Mm. So that was a strong squad. And he sort of built that that team into the Socceroos team as well. Mm. Uh, but Eddie, Eddie was fun because when you work, you work. And when you play, you could go and play, you know, you mm -hmm. could go out for a beer with him, you know, you can, you can lock him in the toilet sometimes and he can't get out. And which was a bit of a, uh, when we played in Korea, we went out drinking and, and Eddie went to the toilet and it was just one of those one, one man cubicles in his bar in, in South Korea. We ended up locking him in there for, <laughs> But he took that as a bit of a joke because you know because we end up having a good game and you know, he could, yeah. and, he, and Eddie could roll with that and he, okay. he was quite, quite a good character off the pitch as well. Yeah. Um. So he wasn't all that you know you know you know I'm not keep myself away from the squad. He was sort yeah. of you know when we played we played hard. You know we didn't party hard but we just went out you know had a good time. Yeah. And then, yeah. And we just you know. How did he get out? Did you let him out or did he somehow I, I, work? I think, I think one of the players let him out. I was okay. one, just one of the youngest players, and I was like sitting in the corner laughing, you know. <laughs> All right, who were the main instigators to lock Eddie Thompson in the toilet? <laughs> I don't know. Um, I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to throw anybody under the bus. That's brilliant. Eddie built a good squad, good character. Like I said, he, he took his character into the squad from, you know, from the Sydney City days into the Socceroo squad. And he learned that from um, from um, Frank Oreck as well, you know, because obviously... Yep. The system coach wasn't he? I think yeah. he was. Yeah. So, and they they, they say that the other soccerers that I speak to that his man management was quite good. He knew how to um, yeah. man, man manage. Um, so, what about what about uh, the tactical side of his uh, of his game? Was he astute tactically in comparison to some of the coaches that you had in England? <sighs> Tactics, what are they? Mm. You know. Um, it wasn't really tactical. He wouldn't say, you know, this is what you got to do on the on the blackboard. It was basically certain players could do certain things on the pitch. Now, if that certain player went somewhere, you got to actually cover him to to you know, fill in that hole. So next to me was a really a Vimar, which was very you know very technical ball player, loved mm -hmm. to get into the box and score. So basically, once a relay was a relay would start moving somewhere, I would come in 
in sort of coverage. So that was more of a tactic that way, learning mm. your field positions. And, and that was the thing about in those days, it was more field positions where you're going to be mm-hmm. when you haven't got the ball, where you're going to be when you got the ball, you know, mm. where that, so there was more covering. Um, and if one player sort of went for a bit of a run, you sort of balance, balance like tucking in. Yeah. Yeah. So there was more tacticals that way. It wasn't more tactics on the blackboard at all. It's, it's certain players, yes, you've got a mark. Um, so it was more tactics um, on the pitch, you know, um, in more real life format, you know, when players are running and, and learning the game. That's what I'm talking about going back to learning the game, not on the blackboard, but on the pitch, you know, it's more mm. tactic that way sort of thing. Um, but in England, the same thing. So that sort of, those things were again, it wasn't more tactical, it was more just, you know, on field um, instructions. Yeah, more instructions sort of thing, you know, because you're playing, we're playing. You know, you're playing sixty odd games a season, and yeah. you know, and and it was basically you were just playing one game, and then you know you get into getting into training, you, you wouldn't do much of training. It was more you know corners for corners against a uh, couple of little. Then it's basically going back to the Dutch system. I was saying that you, you you sort of work with a couple of players around in your midfield or the winger where you started to you know work with them basically to work those combinations. Um, you know, overlapping or running side and things like that. So it basically it was just the players who sort of took that tactics into the game and understanding the game when you're out there, really. Yeah, the um, that that venerable side that you you said that you didn't get selected. Um, you think that you were good enough at that? You know, in uh, in that squad to get selected for the the squad. Did he? Did you get any reasons why? You were cut from that squad? No, not really. Not really. I was sort of I went in there injured because I was I wasn't really playing regularly at Millwall. That was my third season at Millwall where I was sort of fell out with Jimmy Nickel and mm. I had a first couple of months I was injured. Then I'd sort of did a, a hamstring. So I was going into that squad, wasn't really had that many games on the belt that season. So that's probably one of the reasons, you know, I didn't get picked, you know, and and as anything, you know, a lot of a lot of players were coming up into the Dark Soccer Roo squad. Um, um, Lazaridis was coming into it. Yeah. Um, Danny uh, Danny uh, Tiado yeah. coming into it. So you know that left side of players will you know, will come in, you know, producing more as left hand side players, and and a lot of young those young Soccer Roo squad players will come into the squad. You know, the Dukus mm. and Johnny Aloysius and things like that. So you know the, the team was progressing. Um, yeah, there was certain players you think, mm, you know, I've, I've got a bit more, you know, experience, and I was playing that up, you know, in 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 England, and um, yeah, certain players that sort of sort of were playing in Australia didn't have that experience. Sort of, he obviously the coaches, you know, obviously wants his team, so you know, certain players. Yeah. yeah. Okay, but the uh, so suffice to say that m- maybe you were. On on paper, you've got the experience, but maybe you didn't have the best preparation, or you weren't playing the amount mm. of games to to really mm. lock down that one of those left sided positions. Mm. Um, <clears throat> the um, you uh, you gone on um, once your playing career um, finished. Did you after Wollongong? Did you go off uh, to play in the state league at, at Arpia? Did you play play there again? Oh yeah, I went back to Arpia, and that that was just to see if I could still play. Yes, uh, but yeah, it wasn't didn't go too well. Sort of wasn't really there mentally, you know, and physically um, to play at that. How level. old are you now? At, at at that point, are you have, have you tipped forty yet? I think I was thirty seven. Okay. All right. Yeah. Like so, that. yeah. So, so it's yeah. It, it's it's a it's a long and distinguished career. So this way, you, they always say that you know you can play you can play anywhere, but unless you've got those good players around you, there's not. And you, if you don't have good players around you, then, then it's going to be a lot harder for you to try and mm, produce mm. and play week in week out. You know, to carry that. You know. That. Got it. So. So you, you, you look back in your career, right, which is a fantastic career. You got to play in Belgium, in the NSL. You followed your father's footsteps um, representing the country. Um, you played for a number of um, t- 
top English sides, including Manchester City, was uh, arguably the, the the biggest club that you played for at that time. Um, when you look back at your career, um, where are the moments that you think, okay, you know, if I could relive that moment, I want to go back there? Um, I would go back to the beginning, you know, first first game from a Greenacre, you know. I think I stood there waving, waving at the planes. Yes. You know? And then going fast forward to, to AIS where, you know, I was – Starting to understand the game and what football that and those junior years in Australia it was it was, it was easy for me, you know. Um, I was a you know big fish in a in a big pond, you know, in a small pond. Yes. And then and then you start realizing you start playing for AOS, and then we went over to um, we did a tour in Holland and we played against Ipswich and Nottingham Forest, and you start playing against those those top players and those more physical players, and you're thinking, you know, wow, you know, AOS squad will you know walking over teams when we played in the under under 20s mm. NFL. And then we went over to Holland um, and played in the tournaments and thinking, well, this was just you know hard work. Yes. You know, reality hit home what was football was like. And then I sort of um, come back home and sort of went, in that period between the, the 2019, 2021, you get lost. A lot of players get lost in Australia, which yeah. I got lost in, you know, where, where's my career going and so forth. Um, going back to your question, um, oh, I think, you know, playing against Argentina is always going to be the highlight of anyone's mm-hmm. career. Um, that moment when you, you physically hit one of the biggest players in the world and you sort of bounce off him and you realise mm-hmm. that you made a granite and, um, and, you know, the strength of the the player was just unbelievable. So I Maradona was actually so he, he, a lot. So early on in his career, I don't know how he actually got to his because he got really hacked, uh, especially in the early days of playing in the eighties. So he mm. really, really some some of the challenges that mm. he he copped on his legs is so so. But he was really that strong. Oh yeah, physical was strong. Yeah, I'm now I'm never. It was like hitting like a, a block of granite. It was just okay. unbelievable. I played against two players like that. It was him and Mark Hughes who played for for Man, um, Man United. I, I hit, and they just look at you and think, "What?" You know. And I did hit Maradona. I tackled Maradona when I played at the River Plate the second game. I thought I broke his ankle, and I've never prayed so hard for a player to get up because I'm thinking if he doesn't get up and he gets carried off his pitch, I'm not getting out of here tonight. Yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> on the way to the ground, all the supporters just go out to you. Yeah. Out the window, they're saying, you know. We're going to kill you. We're going to kill you. And you yeah. That's the intimidation that happened yeah. in that in that game. So yeah, but Maradona, um, that moment, um, moving on in my career. Um, yeah, the, the the night we beat Arsenal at Highbury two 0 Yes. Uh, set up the first goal. That was a, in that uh, in that what, FA Cup run. Yeah. Yeah. FA Cup run. So, you know, like everyone says, you know, it, it is a glamorous yeah. life, but there is ups and downs and there are yes. little moments and you take those little moments and, um, yeah. yeah, they're good memories. Fantastic. So what advice do you have? Because you've gone on to coach, you, you played, you've been that player that played mm. at the top echelon. Now, if there's that player, sort of that 15, 16, 17, 18, 19 year old boy or girl, what advice do you have for them transitioning from that sort of, that into that performance phase of football. My my advice is basically go out and do it yourself. Train yourself. Go out into the park and and and, and build your own confidence, your own self confidence. Um, I did it a lot. I think a lot of players, a lot of kids are not doing it now. They expect the coach to coach them, or they expect you know someone else to do show them what to do. Um, and there's a transition of, you know, learning your self-belief and, and, and believing in yourself. And I think a lot of young players are expecting something else, the, the, the iPhone to show them what to do or the YouTube will show them what to do, um, which is not reality when, they, you know, when you get out in the pitch and, 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 you, and you're actually physically um, trying to beat someone else. Because that's what happens, I think. A lot of young kids 
they love they're, they're great at training and they're, they're great on watching YouTube and things like that. But when they get on the pitch and they start physically up against someone who's probably more physical or stronger, then they start. Oh, this is too hard. I want to go and you know try something else. You know, mm. this is a bit too hard, Dad. I'm not sure. So that's where I think a lot of kids should just get out there and 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 train themselves make things up the head like I used to do, you know, how many juggles you could do, throw the ball up 10 times and try and you know, catch it on your chest or things like that. So try and build your own self, self-confidence. Fantastic words of wisdom. Jason Van Blurk, you, you've had a fantastic career. Thank you for your continued contribution to Australian football. It's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you, sir. Thanks very much for having me. Have a good day. Hey guys, we've come to the end of this episode. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate you taking the time to listen to our wonderful guest. If you like this type of content and would like to see more, how about you hit the like and subscribe button and have a fantastic day.